Hi everybody, welcome to NE630, Introduction to Nuclear Reactor Physics. Uh, my name is uh, Ali Abdu and I am a professor at the Nuclear Engineering Department. So let me first give you my contact information in case you want to contact me. So this is my first name, my second name and I am at 137 D Ward Hall. If you cannot find me at 137, most probably I am at 142 also Ward Hall. This is my lab and you can uh, contact Muhammad at the end of the uh, uh, office here or, or class. He's my student. He will know where, where I am so you, you can contact him anytime. Also, you can email me at aeabdou at ksu.edu. In case you want my office phone number, 785-532-7182. So, uh, again, this is as I just stated. Nuclear Reactor Theory course. The course will be uh, meeting here Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 1.30 to 2.20. And for the office hours, usually, can you share this one until I finish this one and I will give it to you. So the, the office hour, usually I have, I have, for this semester, I have the office hour open. So whenever you, you need any help, just stop by my, my office and I will be more than happy to help. If I am busy, and you have, for example, time to come back, I will ask you to come back. If it is urgent, I will uh, put my, my things aside and try to help you. Uh, the uh, textbook for the course is Stacy, and this is what we taught last semester. It's a nuclear reactor physics. It is two parts. The first one is for this uh, class. So we'll be studying uh, chapters uh, part one, the neutron uh, nuclear reaction, neutron chain fission reaction, the neutron diffusion theory, the neutron energy distribution, the nuclear reactor dynamics, uh, the fuel burn-up, and all the types of nuclear power reactors. If we have time before the end of the semester, we will just visit the reactor safety. Last, last year, we did not uh, discuss the reactor safety. The second part is the advanced reactor physics and I think if I, I think all of you are nuclear nuclear engineering majors, yes? Or option. So I think if you take the neutronic class with Dr. Bill Don, he would be able to uh, figure out the second part, although he does not teach it from this book. Uh, for further or optional reading, if you are interested, uh, what I noticed from the Stacy book that he grabbed parts from different books and compile his book. So mainly he uses Lamarche Introduction to Nuclear Reactor Theory and I give it to you here in the, uh, in the uh, uh, syllabus. Lamarche Reactor Theory is a very excellent book. I studied this one when I was like you undergrad. And the beauty of Lamarche is it is physically, physics oriented. So if you want to understand the physics, it is physics oriented. Uh, there is Henry. And uh, Henry is a, a little bit more, uh, more advanced and, and also a little bit difficult because Henry is mathematically ad, uh, uh, advanced or mathematically oriented. It's different from Lamarche. Lamarche treats the problem from the physics point of view, although it has mathematics. But Henry, the mathematics is, is more solid and more rigid. Um, in between, and it's very, very nice to read, it's a very readable book, is Doderstadt and Hamilton. Nuclear reactor analysis, and this is one of the books that I find that it it puts more um, uh, focus in in how the reactor is designed. It has chapter in uh, uh, the transport theory, neutron transport transport theory, and so on. It's a very very readable book and very nice book. So I like it. I like it the best over the three books. So you have it. You can search the library here and and check out the book, for example. So during this semester, we will have four. Uh, homeworks. Uh, the four homeworks will count for 40% toward your grade. So for 
uh, 10% each. We will have a midterm um, maybe uh, after two months from now or so we'll have the uh, midterm. I did not decide yet the date. Uh, it will count for 20%. The final exam will count for 30% and there is a 10% that will count for the participation in the class. So uh, hopefully uh, nobody will, will, will lose the 10%. Everybody will, will get the 10%. So last, last year, for example, I have, uh, I think I have 12 or 13 people or something, student in the class. Nobody got C except one, and he did horrible. So hopefully nobody will, <laughs> <laughs> nobody will get C. Hopefully, I, I so just you will earn the grade. I did not give you grades. You will earn the grade. So try to help me, and I will be more than happy to help, of course, in the uh, in the course. Uh, you will see that I I put here underlined statement with red and bold. Note that the homework problems may be assigned from outside the book. Because um, usually, again, I did not only focus in this book. Usually, I, I wrote my lectures from this book, Dutrichstadt, Henry, uh, Lamarche. And also, there is another book, which is just a very easy book, but, but it brings stuff from air, So, which is Fundamental of Reactor Physics by uh, Lewis, if you are interested in this book. It's, it's uh, Fundamentals. of reactor physics and the author is Lewis. So this is a very concise book. The whole book is almost 200 pages, 230 pages. So it's, it's very good if you understand the physics here and you want to review before the exam date or something like this, you can go and read it. But the problem is sometimes it gives you uh, some definition and, and that's it. There is no any mathematical derivation or anything like this. You do not know where he brought this, uh, for example, formula or something like this. So it's better to focus on the lecture notes, of course, or the lectures and also the book here and try to hover around the four uh, textbook that I give it to you. Um, again, I just talked to you about the chapters that we will be studying during this semester. One of the very important thing is the ad academic misconduct. Uh, you are more than welcome to, uh, to work the homework together. But you are not allowed to copy each other homework. Last year, um, there is two students who came and I noticed that they copy and paste, although they change the wording. So the wording was different, but the steps for solution is exactly the same. And when I asked, I asked them to meet me in the office after the, uh, the first homework was turned on and I, I asked both of them that this is pleasurizing and I, I will not tolerate it and, and I told them that uh, why you did this and one of them he said oh it's not pleasurizing I did not do it and then I show them the two copies and I say okay I do not care about wording here is the steps although he something like omitted a couple of, of uh, symbols and stuff like this. And finally I say, well, I was busy and I was out of town and I was sick and then he advised to help and, and stuff like this. Then I said, okay, if you are sick, please come and tell me and I will be more than happy to extend the, ho the homework uh, return date for you if, if you are sick. <coughs> if, if there is, for example, something like out of your hands, I am not here to torture anybody. I am here to help you understand the material. And if I did not uh, accomplish this goal, this, this means that I am not successful. So just stop by my office and tell me openly, Dr. Abdo, I, I have a problem and I will be more than happy to help all of you. Uh, but please, if you have anything like this, please, more than welcome to work all together, but you are not welcome to copy each other homework. So this is... Uh, this is this, this one. Um, if you visited K-State online, those lectures are videotaped for the uh, Big 12 students. So you are more than welcome. Also, all of you have access to the uh, K-State online. So this lecture will be videotaped and you can 
just review the lecture again, watch the videos and see if you have any comments or anything like this. I, I will welcome your visit to my office. Um, there is uh, hands out that I put in the uh, case state online for uh, mathematical cheat sheets. So uh, you can look at those mathematical cheat sheets. I try to help you. So I bought everything that you will need in your undergrad, even not in this course, but anything in the College of Engineering. So you will find uh, anything in uh, advanced engineering mathematics, like solving differential equation, vector analysis, uh, uh, integral transform, special functions. You will find stuff like algebra, stuff like geometry, everything you need. I bought it in a PDF files. You are more than welcome to download it to your computer and use it, although it's not mine. So if you, if you want to distrib distribute it or anything like this, look for the author and then uh, contact him for distribution. But for your own uh, personal use, I already contacted the authors and, and I take permission to put the stuff online. So um, that's it for today. So just a, a, a quick introduction before we, we go to the, uh, the course itself. Um, this course is not meant to be a design course for nuclear reactors. And when I was like you in undergrad, I studied Lamarche, uh, the whole book. And then I participated in the design of our nuclear reactor in Egypt, and I went to Argentina. And at this time, I went to the company, and they start talking to me about joining the department, the nuclear uh, core design department. Then they start talking about cell calculation and core calculation and stuff like this. And I have no clue what they are talking about, although I studied Lamarche. So this is not a design course. But in order to understand the, the, the course itself, it will be better if we will talk briefly about how nuclear reactors are designed and stuff like this, so that you will appreciate, OK, why I am studying this and, and why I am taking this and that. So it will be verbally. I am not, I'm not going to discuss anything, because it will be very extremely complicated. So if you look at the book, the first chapter is usually about cross-sections and, and nuclear reactions and stuff like this. So neutron nuclear reactions. So why we need to know the neutron nuclear reactions? Very simple, because if we want to design a nuclear reactor, there is two major equations will be utilized in designing nuclear reactions. The first one, usually people will use what they call transport equation. If they want to do a simple calculation or something like this, or, or a subset for the transport codes, usually they use what they call diffusion uh, codes. So whether you will use transport equation or diffusion equation, we are not going to discuss the transport equation during this course. It's in the higher level course. But most probably we will encounter the derivation of the uh, diffusion equation. We will Maybe we will solve the one group diffusion equation and so on. In order to solve the diffusion equation, the diffusion equation will have terms. It's just diffusion equation is just uh, an equation, continuity equation. And all of you know what is the continuity equation. So continuity equation, let's say that you have any physical property of interest. Let's say the physical property is L. And you want to know how this property change. So you have, a, you have what we call continuity equation. So we'll say, let's take a control volume and look for this L here. And then we'll say that the time rate of change of this property inside this control volume will be equal to um, the what gets in that feeds this and what gets out. So it will, let's say that I have the N is, let's say, L, L dot inlet. And what gets out is L dot outlet. So it will be L dot inlet minus L dot outlet. What, what's this? So this is how you feed this quantity by just injecting the quantity with time into the control volume. Then the quantity capital L decreases because part of it leaves the control volume. 
and then you will add any generation of this quantity inside the control volume. So let's take, let's take for example, talk about something like we are talking about a chemical reaction that produces something inside the control volume. So if the chemical reaction produces water, so there is water production because of, let's say, a chemical reaction. And you have abstraction term, let's call it D. So you have Q dot and D dot inside. So this is just a continuity equation. So the neutron, the neutron transport equation is exactly the same. A transport equation that describe how the neutrons are uh, conserved inside the reactor system. So the neutrons are conserved inside the reactor system. The time rate of change of total number of neutrons or the flux inside the nuclear reactor is equal to uh, those two terms. We call them the leakage term. So here is the volume of the reactor and there is neutrons getting out from the reactor surface. So this is called the leakage term. So usually we will denote this as divergence of the current and we will know all those terminology later on in the course. Then we will have a production. What do you think? How the neutrons will be produced inside the nuclear reactor core? Through fission. Through fission, yes. So you will have a term here that will have something like this. Sigma fission multiplied by the flux. And this equation by the way, by way, by the way, is uh, per unit volume. If you have a continuity equation, it will be per unit volume. So this is the production rate inside the nuclear reactor. Then there is a destruction rate. Where do you think the, the neutrons will go, other than leakage? Absorption. Will be absorbed. So we will have here minus sigma absorption phi, and sigma absorption phi is the total number of neutrons absorbed per unit volume per second inside the volume of the reactor. Then what else? What do you think? Um, we have already the fission. Do you think we have sources or, or sinks other than the fission and delayed, absorption? Delayed it, is, it is included in the fission. We will talk about it in, in details during the course. What else do you think? The decay, uh, it, it's very, very, yeah, it's, it, it's included here also. But what do you think? If we have what we call external or extraneous neutron source, uh, nuclear reactors, so you will have here external source. If you want to start the nuclear reactor, for example, you will notice that at the very early beginning of the core, you need some seed neutrons so that the reactor will start. And then once the neutrons emitted from the source and it will encounter the nuclei, it will start the fission process then you will have the sustaining nuclear um, reaction, the uh, chain reaction, yes? So you need this source. Usually in, in the uh, trigger reactor here at the K-state, uh, we have an external source that's, that's inside or outside the core to feed those, feed those neutrons. In our reactor, when I was working in the reactor in Egypt, we put the extraneous source at the very early beginning, then we removed it and we no longer need it because as you said, the uh, fission products will produce gamma rays. And around the nuclear core, we have what we call reflector. Our reflector, the reflector here was made of uh, ca uh, carbon or graphite. Uh, graphite. The, re the reflector in Egypt reactor was made of uh, beryllium. And beryllium has a very good property. It has a, a nuclear reaction called photoneutron reactions. So gamma rays will hit the beryllium and it will liberate one of the neutrons from the nuclei of the uh, beryllium. So this, is, this work as, a, uh, as an extraneous source for us. So we do not need to put any, any extraneous source inside the reactor after the first startup. So this is one of the things that you can think about. So this is the reactor equation. So as you see here, <coughs> the reactor equation will have lots of parameters. So this is d phi by dt, and you'll have one over the velocity. So let's ignore the flux a little bit. What do you think? You have what? Lots of parameters. We have cross sections and stuff like this, yes? So this is why we need to understand how the neutron interact with, with matter. And this is the, the, uh, the first chapter.
why, why we want to understand the nuclear reactions. Why? Because we need the nuclear reactions to understand it, then to experimentally evaluate <coughs> the values of what? Of the cross-sections. Because the cross-sections later on will be used in the diffusion equation or the transport equation. So if you look at chapter number one, which is the basic reactor physics, the, the neutron, neutron nuclear reactions, you will notice that this chapter will talk about the nuclear reaction. The second chapter will talk more, more specifically about the fission process and how the fission take place and the cross-section and all the parameters involved in the fission uh, itself. Then, when you will do the solution or perform the solution for this equation, usually this is, the transport equation is very complex or very complicated equation. So there is a problem. We cannot just solve it, solve it analytically, except for uh, very special cases. So we need to solve it using computers. So we need to have uh, numerical analysis techniques to solve the diffusion equation or the transport equation. If you want to do this, so you have to have initial values for, for parameters like the flux. So if you want to understand what's the initial value of the flux, you have to know how the flux look like inside a nuclear reactor. Yes? So usually, if you are talking about a nuclear reactor, the neutrons will induce fission. What do you think? What's the average energy, neutral average neutron energy for the neutrons emitted from the fission? Do you have any idea? 200 MeV. No, the 200 MeV is the total energy released per fission, but the neutrons will carry energy. Do you remember the average energy? It's around 2 MeV. Yeah, 1.98 MeV. The most probable is 0.7 MeV. So if you look for the distribution for the neutron, let's say that the y-axis will be the distribution function and the x-axis will be the energy. So this is, we will call it f of e, where f of e gives me the number of neutrons carrying energy between e and e plus delta e. So if we look at this distribution function and we look way here in the fission energy range, we will notice that we will have something like a distribution like this. We will visit this in, in details. So this is the distribution of the neutrons emitted from the fission, for example. This distribution is called chi of E. Okay? Chi of E. Then when the neutrons are emitted from the fission, what they will do? They will encounter the two types of nuclei. The first one are the fuel nuclei, and then the second one, if they escape fuel, they will encounter the moderator nuclei, which is water. So what they will happen, what they will do with the nuclei, they will have multiple knocks, yes, until they will be thermalized. So when they have this process, we call it neutron moderation. So you are moderating the energy of the neutrons. So you will notice that the neutrons will decrease the number of neutrons with, with energies, let's say, from the fission and, and below, will be doing something like this. And then once the neutrons will be moderated and they have energies, let's say, above the thermal energy of water, which is, let's say, if the water is at uh, 300 uh, degree Kelvin or something like this, or 290 something, this means that the energy is around, this is the temperature, the energy is around 0.025, 25 milli electron volts. They will start thermalizing their energy with the, with the uh, nuclei or atoms of the medium. What, what do we mean by thermalizing? So they will reach to the, the, the moment that the energy taken from the, the uh, water molecules or water atoms is exactly equal to the energy given to the water molecule, so there is not, no net 
no net exchange. They have the similar energy like the water, and in this case, they will have a distribution called Maxwellian distribution. So this is called the Maxwellian distribution, and this is called 1 over E distribution. How did we know this? So we will know this by studying the uh, chapter number uh, 4, the neutron energy distribution. Okay, so we'll study chapter number 4, and this will give us how the neutron behaves in the fission energy region in the uh, thermal thermalization or moderation energy region. This is called, by the way, EB, EB thermal, EB thermal region. And this is fast region, and this is thermal region. So usually, for you to remember, the thermal region starts from anywhere very, very low energy up to nearly one electron volt. And the AB thermal starts from one electron volt up to 100,000 electron volts. And then the fast region, which is the fission region, will start from anywhere from 100,000. There is neutrons reported to get out of fission up to 10 million electron volt, but this is a very rare number of neutrons. But let's say up to 5, five mev or so will be the upper limit, 5, 10 mev, something like this. So now, if we knew by studying chapter number uh, uh, 4, the neutron energy distribution, once we study this chapter, we'll be able to figure out this, this distribution, how we get it, and so on. We will be using, in, in higher courses, we will be using this uh, flux distribution to give an initial guess, for example, to calculate stuff like cross-section average, cross-section overgrow, energy groves, and stuff like this. So, so this is this part. Chapter number three will be mainly about neutron diffusion theory, and we will be driving the diffusion equation in this, in this chapter. So, um, um, this is called, if we, if we neglect the time rate of a change term, it's called the steady state. So you have an equilibrium between production and losses in your system. So this is not the case. If the reactor is running uh, in a steady state mode and the power is constant, usually this is the case. But let's say during the startup or during transitions or during um, uh, a shutdown or during uh, a power change modes or stuff like this, you are no longer in a steady state mode, you are in a transition mode and, 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 and you have to, to, look, to look for the solution for the time rate of change. Um, further on on the course, we will look at the uh, classification of nuclear reactors from the neutronic point of view and then we will be able to figure out that there is two types of uh, uh, nuclear reactors, one is called uh, neutronically tightly coupled core and neutronically loosely coupled core and then we will, once we differentiate between both, we'll be able to drive the point kinetic equation. And this point kinetic equation, we will assume that the reactor, the, the function for the flux can be decomposed to two separate functions multiplied by each other. One is a time dependent, the other one is a special dependent. And we will say that the special dependent function, which is the shape of the flux inside the reactor core, let's say we have a cylinder. So inside the cylinder or cylindrical core, the flux will be sinusoidal in the, in the z direction. That will be basal function in the radial direction. We will study this in details. So we will assume that the shape, shape does not change for the point kinetic equation, but what change is how the flux will vary with time. The shape will be like this that might be increasing as the power increase or decreasing as the power decrease and then we will solve the reactor as if it is a point in a space. So this is what we call the point uh, diffusion equation. So this is, this will be chapter number five, uh, the nuclear reactor dynamics. Um, of course, when you run the reactor for long enough time, for the point kinetic calculation, when you do small calculation, something like, um, 
a day or two, you assume that you did not burn your fuel, for example, inside the nuclear reactor. But for long operation, something like month or years or something like this, you will notice that the, the, the fuel is, is depleted. So you have to take into consideration the depletion of the fuel and also there is a buildup of fission products that will affect the performance and operation of your reactor like uh, what we call um, uh, uh, poisons like uh, uh, samarium and, and xenon and those will affect the, the operation of the nuclear reactor. We will study this in detail. So this will be the fuel burn up and then we will co conclude with the different types of nuclear reactors. So I, I give you some sort of road map of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the course because last year people complain, okay, I, I don't understand why we study this. I, did you understand? Oh, I understand, but you know what? I do not know why you are doing all this work and all this mathematics and stuff, the stuff that you are doing in the blackboard, for example. So now, just imagine this is like a complete analysis now. We are preparing you to understand the different physical processes taking place inside the nuclear reactor, then, then uh, the next step is to get into the advanced courses for neutronics, let's say for radiation transport, calculation, and, and once you will, you will do your future, let's say, uh, graduate research work, you will get to know the reactor design uh, codes and uh, reactor design calculation. So this is just the, uh, the introduction for this one here. So let's, let's start now the first uh, chapter. And our first chapter will be how much can you list them? Which one? This one? Did you see now? You can you can turn on the one near side if you want. Yeah. Oh no, the other one. Yes. Thank you. So we'll study the first first chapter here. Uh, so before getting into the details of uh, the uh, neutron nuclear interaction, I have to remind you some of the uh, basic elements of, of uh, nuclear physics or atomic physics that you study last year with, or the year before in the uh, NEA 495. So let's start with the definition of the stable nuclei. <coughs> so the, the nucleus, the atomic nucleus is composed of particles, protons and neutrons. And what makes, what holds the nucleus tight is the nuclear forces. And those nuclear forces will have the domain of the nucleus itself. So outside, way outside the nucleus, the nuclear forces drop to zero. So there is no uh, there is no existence for the nuclear forces outside the nucleus. So the range of the nuclear forces will be just, let's say, the, the radius uh, of the nucleus itself. And if you look at the equation that represents the atomic or the nuclear radii uh, versus the atomic, uh, atomic number, this is the relation here. So 1.25 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 13 A to the power of one third. And it's, it's very easy to derive this uh, equation. Just, you will say that, okay, uh, uh, the number of nu nucleons inside the nucleus, which is number of neutrons and protons, will, will vary with the volume of the, uh, of the uh, nucleus. And what is the volume of the nucleus? It's uh, four over three, if you consider the nucleus as a sphere, 4 over 3 multiplied by pi r cubed. So if, if you inverse the equation, you will notice that r is equal to some constant multiplied by a to the power of 1 third. And this, cor this constant happens to be uh, uh, the 1.25 1 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 13. So it's a very direct representation here. So if we look at the, <coughs> the stability curve, what do we mean by stability curve? So if we try to represent for example, the number of protons, if we will collect all the known isotopes in the universe 
and then have the y-axis as the number of protons in each one of those isotopes and the x-axis as the number of neutrons inside the isotope. Then we will say, okay, hydrogen. How many protons inside hydrogen? One. Is there any neutrons? No. So we will put it here. So zero for the number of neutrons and one for the number of uh, uh, protons. Then deuterium, one, two. So you have one neutron, so it will be one, one. Okay? And so on. And you start <coughs> putting the, those isotopes in the uh, graph here for N versus Z. You will notice that we will construct this uh, plot here, which we will call it the uh, uh, stability or, or the, the uh, stable and unstable nuclide. Of course, you will notice that we have unstable nuclei and we have stable nuclei. How we will define stable and unstable nuclei? So scientists look at what they call the N over Z ratio, or sometimes they call it N over P ratio. N, where N is the total number of neutrons inside the nucleus, and Z or P is the total number of protons inside the nucleus. So if you look at this ratio <coughs> and represent it here, if N is equal to P or Z here, this will give you a straight line, 45 degree slope. So we will notice that for a small um, isotopes, small, small isotopes or atoms, the ratio is nearly one. So if you look at oxygen 16, what's, what's Z for oxygen 16? Is eight, 16 or 16. So eight proton, eight neutrons. So the number is one, one, one to one. Magnesium 24, you will find that magnesium is what? If you divide by two, it will be 12. So 12 over 12. If you look at silicon, 14, so 14 over 14 is 1, and if you look at calcium, is what? It's 20 over 20 is also 1. Then once you move a little bit beyond this, the, the smaller or light nuclei, you will notice that you will deviate from the 1 to 1 ratio line. So you will deviate from this line. You will notice here, here is the line, and then the, the uh, the stability curve will be skewed, skewed towards the N here. So I have two representation. One of those is N is the X axis, Z is the Y axis. The other one, N is the Y axis and Z is the X axis. So you will find those two flavors usually in the literature. Sometimes people will represent it like this or like this. It does not matter. So you will see this skewness or the curvature of the curve is toward what? Toward the higher number of neutrons. Why? Why do you think when the, when the atomic mass number increases, in order for the nucleus to be stable, you need more neutrons? Must give up mass for binding energy. Yes, because inside the nucleus, you will have what? Protons. And the protons are charged positively. So they will start repelling each other. Yes? So in order to overcome this repulsive force between the protons inside the nucleus, you have to have something that does not or some particle that does not depend on the charge. And always, all the time, they will have attraction between themselves. And what's, what's this particle? It's the neutron. Because the neutrons does not have any charge, so they will attract each other and they will hold the nucleus together. This is why you need more neutrons to compensate for the repulsive force between the protons. And this is what you will see here. So you will, you will notice that once we go up the curve, this ratio is no longer one to one. This is the one to one curve here, but the ratio for the stability line will go something like 1.3 or so. So the most log logical explanation, I, as I just stated, is the neutrons, the R neutrons, and they do not reveal each other. And you need those neutrons in order to overcome the, uh, the, repulsive, uh, the repulsive force. So now, let's proceed and discuss <coughs> the binding energy. What do we mean by binding energy? So, the binding energy, if, if we assume that we can uh, construct the atom, for example, and we visited the, the atom workshop, and we start looking for the shelves, and we said, okay, we want to construct the oxygen atom, which is 816. So, I asked you to go to the, the, the 
uh, for example, the drawer where the protons are, and I asked you to buy eight protons. And then you will I uh, get another eight neutrons. And then you will bring the eight protons and eight neutrons, and before you put the glow between them and form the atom, I asked you to wait the protons alone, the neutrons alone. Then you add the masses of all the protons and neutrons together. Then <coughs> you weighted all the mass of the protons and neutrons, which they are separate now, and then you construct your atom, you, s you squeeze everything together until you feel heat in your, ha in your hands, and then you weighted the atom after you uh, finish the, per the, the performing the process, for example. What you will discover is the mass of the constructed atom that you just constructed is less than the mass of the constituents. Where is the difference? Where it, it went? So this difference is the binding energy. It, it's, it transforms it from mass to energy to hold the constituents of the nucleus together and to keep the nucleus tight. So this is what we call the binding energy. Again, if we get all the isotopes in the universe, and then look at the, the mass number A, which is this one. And we'll put the mass number in the x-axis. Okay? And we do this construction, thought construction experiment. And I start looking for one by one for each of the isotopes and measure the binding energy. But we will not just measure the binding energy, but we will measure the total binding energy. Then we will divide by the total number of nucleons inside the nucleus to get the average binding energy bare, bare particle. And this is what we call the binding energy bare, bare particle. So if we do this, we will construct this, this binding energy curve. And this binding energy curve has very nice uh, properties. What are the nice properties? We will notice that it has a maximum here around um, steel or, or iron, uh, around uh, iron here, at, let's say, iron and nickel and, and, and uh, those, those isotopes, then it start, start decreasing. So if you come to the very heavy elements, uh, like, like uranium-235, for example, if you try to hit the uranium-235 with X and split uranium-235, what will happen? If you split the, the uranium-235 into two equal pieces, most probably it will be somewhere around here. Yes? Because the atomic bus number, if you divide 238 by 2, this will give you what? Uh, 1 and 38 is, uh, is 19, 119 maybe? 119, 120. So 119, 120, you would be here. What do you think? Here versus here. The binding energy is lower or higher? Higher. So, so you split a single atom with a lower binding energy and you produce two stable nuclei because when the binding energy is high, the nucleus is more stable. So you produce two more stable nuclei here. So where is the difference of the binding energy will go? It will be released as, as energy for the forming particle or the particle that you form. And of course, this process is called fission. So if you have a neutron that hit the uranium-235, the neutron will act like the X. And then it will split the nucleus here, produce two here, you will have two fig fission fragments and a neutron. And the energy difference, the binding energy difference, will be carried by those three constituents. But because the neutron is very small mass and it is chargeless, it will escape from the site where it is uh, generated in the fission and will leave the whole fuel to the moderator and then uh, 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 moderate and thermalize and then induce another nuclear reaction and so on. But the, for the fission fragments, they will still in, still in the same location, more or less in the crystal lattice of the fuel. Maybe they will move a little bit, something like micron or so, but they will jiggle around and then finally come to stop. So the total energy produced per fission, this is what you just mentioned, which is a 200 million electron volts, 
it will be distributed among the three constituents and also among the gamma rays and there is neutro neutrinos involved and neutrinos they do not they are massless chargeless they will escape from the whole reactor so so this is the fission process in reverse of this process there's another exciting process which is of similar beauty to the uh, to the uh, first process and this is what we call nuclear fusion so you can fuse particles from here or isotopes from here to form a higher mass number isotope here and this is uh, low uh, binding energy isotopes and you form a higher binding binding energy isotopes and then you will produce this difference will be given as as uh, energy to the neutrons this process is called fusion process and and a representative here for the fusion process if you have the second isotope of hydrogen which we call proton uh, deut deutrons so this is deuterium and the particle of deuterium is called deutrons so deutron deutron usually we call it d d reaction so d hits d and then produce helium 3 and neutrons and there is 17.6 million electron volt involved so this 17.6 million electron volt 3.5 million electron volt or 3.6 million electron volt will be given to the helium alpha particle and 14.6 uh, million electron volt will be given to the neutron and this is the nuclear reaction that's responsible for producing energy in 99% of the universe so this is the nuclear reaction that took place in sun this is the nuclear reaction that took place in uh, uh, all the stars and this is the goal of humanity to substitute for energy through nuclear fusion and if you look at ITER www.iter.org this is the international thermonuclear experimental reactor being built in Cabarachin in, in France to achieve this goal of har harnessing the nuclear fusion energy for humanity. So did you understand this one? Did you have any questions? Let's move on and, and give you some, uh, some hints about the, uh, the stability and, and the uh, So the minimum energy needed if you want to induce a nuclear fission. So the minimum energy needed to induce a nuclear fission is called threshold energy. So you have to give this energy to the nucleus in order to induce the fission. And this is the threshold energy. So the threshold energy is very high if the number of protons is less than, less than 90. For anything less than 90, so let's just go... Uh, one time here back so if you are here up to here let's say Krypton and maybe 90 is here anywhere here if you want to split any of those nuclei they have very high very high uh, binding energy so they are very tightly bound in order to, to, to fission them in order to split them you have to give very high energy very high energy and this is why because they are with a high uh, uh, binding energy. Now, if you, if Z is bigger than 90, usually for even mass number, even mass number, you need four to five mass. But for odd mass number, you need very low energy. And this is what we will discuss here in, in the next slide. So for certain nucleides, nucleides, like polutinium 240 and californium 252 they exhibit a significant spontaneous fission so without anything without any touch from anywhere you will find that the nucleus will say oh i have excessive energy inside me so i will just split to release some energy and it will produce a neutron and this is the californium this californium here is used is being used in nuclear industry as a neutron source so sometimes you will hear the terminology that okay we have a californium source here that produce such and such was this activity and the and the production is coming from what it's coming from the spontaneous fission 
Okay, did you understand this? So, now, if we proceed, let's define a couple of, uh, couple of uh, terminology here before we go into the details. We will define what we call facile material, fissionable material, and fertile material. So what does it mean? Facile material. So the facile material is any material that induces fission, and not only induces fission. So it will induce it, and it will also sustain it. So it will keep the fission going on. So it will induce the fission, it will sustain it, a nuclear reaction at low energy. Uh, some example of those isotopes are the uranium-233, 235, plutonium 239 and plutonium 241 if, you, if we look back at the previous slide, we will note that for a Z greater than 90, 233, 235 is greater, 92 is greater than 90, yes? So, 233, 235, 241, 239, is it Z, is it A even or odd? So this is why we said, last, this slide is very low for odd nucleides. So for odd nucleides, we'll note that this is odd, 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 odd. The, the nuclei will fission if you have a neutron just sitting next to the uh, nucleus. So even with zero thermal energy. Of course, there is nothing called zero, but for uranium-235, in order to induce the fission, you need... 25 milli electron volt, which is very, very low. So whenever you have a 25 milli electron volt neutron sitting to next to the nucleus, it will have a very good appetite, take it inside, and then spill it. So this is why you see that <coughs> it, it is a fissile material. Fissionable material, those are the material that can undergo fission, but usually at higher energy, uh, usually at higher energy, but they cannot sustain the nuclear chain reaction. And those are the even uh, A nuclei that we talk about them. So all of them are above 90, as we just described in, in the last slide. And all of them are even A. So if you have even A and above 90, usually you need a threshold energy, high threshold energy in order to induce the fission. And one of the example is the uranium-238. Of course, all of you know that the uranium that, that, that exists in nature comes with two isotopes, three isotopes, the third one is very minute, but two isotopes, 238, 235. 238 is 92.97, 99.3% and the other one is 0.7%. So 993 and the other one is 0.7. So, so this is why, this is why we will note that the 238 is important in nuclear reaction and we will we'll understand why it's important. 238 does not uh, go in, in, uh, in thermal fission. It on only proceeds for the fast fission. And you need an energy, a threshold energy of a couple of hundred kilo electron volts. So you, can you compare it? A couple of hundred kilo, 100,000 electron volts compared to 25 milli electron volts. So kilo electron volts, hundreds of kilo electron volts. This is 10 to the power of 5. The other one, to the power of minus three, you have an eight order of magnitude difference between both of them. And there is fertile material. So what's the fertile material? It's the material that we use it in order to produce a fissile material. So uranium-238, it's fissionable. So it, it, ha it can undergo fission, but it cannot sustain the fission. And also it's a fertile. Why? Because if I bombard the 238 with a, with a neutron, what will happen is it will transform to... Uh, 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 plutonium 239. So I will stop here and continue next time.